Hi aspirants, welcome to this week's current affairs discussion for polity and international relations. In the previous video, we said that we have ample amount of discussions for international relations for this week. So, we will be posting a separate video for international relations alone. So, this will be that video. The first topic is going to be about the India and the Ukraine war. So, how India is getting affected or getting benefited with this Ukraine war or what is the position of India with this Ukraine war. This is in news because India abstained from voting in the United Nations General Assembly resolution to remove Russia from the United Nations Human Rights Council. So, the resolution was to remove Russia from UNHRC and India has abstained from voting and this is something to be noted here because India has not supported Russia here as well. Russia says it will treat voters of yes and abstainers as non-friendly nations. So, abstaining from voting does not mean that India is going to be in the good books of Russia. Russia says it will treat those who vote yes for this resolution and also those who abstain from voting that is those who do not vote in support of Russia also will be treated as non-friendly nations. You have to note this. And it has become difficult for India to maintain a diplomatic move in the issue after the mass killings of civilians by Russia in a place called in the town of Bucha which is to the north of Kiev in Ukraine and this pronunciation for Bucha in different uh, in there are certain places where they pronounce it as Buka in some places they pronounce it as Bucha but whatever so we can take whatever we like it that's it on March 24 India abstained on the resolution which was pushed by Russia in the United Nations Security Council on the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine so the resolution was perceived to be critical of Ukraine. So, it has India has also abstained from voting when Russia pushed a resolution also. So, it is really a critical situation for India here. This resolution failed to get adopted as it did not get the required 9 votes to pass. We know for any resolution to pass in the United Nations Security Council, to pass in the United Nations Security Council, it needs 9 votes in total. That is, we know the United Nations Security Council, it has the 5 members plus the 10 permanent members. The 5 members are permanent, they are always permanent, they have veto powers. The next 10 permanent members, they keep rotating, we know that. And so, out of these 15 members, for a resolution to pass in the United Nations Security Council, we need 9 votes for it. But since Russia was not able to get these 9 votes, the resolution failed as well. And India being a member at this present time, within those 15 members, India has abstained from voting as well. Something to be noted here is, that was the first time India had abstained on a Russia sponsored resolution. This particular resolution was started by Russia, but this resolution has been abstained from India and this is the first time in history here, because Russia pushed the resolution to show that Ukraine is bad, something like that. But this had happened after this mass civilian killings in the Bukha town. So, India was not able to support Russia in this resolution. And something to be known here now by us is the word called war crimes. So, what is a war crime? So, they are defined as grave breaches. So, what is a breach? They are called as grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions or agreements signed after the World War II that laid down international humanitarian laws during wartime. So, if anything breaches the Geneva Conventions, if you breach the Geneva Conventions or any other agreement signed after the World War II regarding the humanitarian laws, that will be called as a war crime. And particularly, if something is done which deliberately targets civilians, 
amounts to a war crime. So, two things, if you breach Geneva Conventions or if you target civilians, if you do any of these two, it will be called as a war crime. So, this is the definition of a war crime. The International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court, which is headquartered at The Hague, has already opened an investigation into the possible war crimes by Russia. Russia does not recognize the International Criminal Court and will likely not cooperate with the investigation. So, something to be noted here is Russia does not recognize International Criminal Court. This could be a prelims question. So, you have to know this. Then, so just now we saw about what is a war crime. The next word to be noted here is genocide. So, what is a genocide? The crime of genocide as defined by the United Nations Genocide Convention of 1948. So, note down these things very specifically. So, it has been defined in the United Nations Genocide Convention of 1948. So, how a question could be in prelims is, the genocide has been described in the United Nations General Assembly. It has been defined under the United Nations Security Council. Such questions could come, but actually a genocide has been defined under the United Nations Genocide Convention of 1948. It includes acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or a religious group. Simply, if something is done with an idea of destroying a particular group that could group uh, that could be a national group a racial group a religious group whatever it is if you decide to destroy a group of people that is called as a genocide this is the definition for a genocide and genocide is seen as the gravest and most serious of all crimes against humanity this data you could use it very well in a prelims exam i'm sorry in a mains exam so, it is said that genocide is seen as the gravest and most serious of all crimes against humanity because any crime against humanity, it could be a war, it could be a direct murder or something. That is because of a particular reason. You have enmity with a single person or you have a war with a nation. That's different. But just because a, people, uh, a group of people belonged to so any group, like belong to a particular religion, belong to a particular nation, belong to a particular caste or whatever. For that reason, if a group of people are killed, that is called as the gravest and most serious crime of humanity. And how would you find out whether a genocide has happened somewhere or not? This is in uh, news because, so there is an investigation going on whether Russia has committed genocide in Ukraine. So, Russia says no, but Ukraine claims, yes, this is a genocide. But how does Ukraine claim this as a genocide? We have to see. In this case, the Russians have the intent to destroy in part a national group. That's the Ukrainian group. So, Ukraine claims that here the Russia's idea is to destroy a group of people belonging to a particular country. Just, belong, just because they belong to a country, they are targeted. So, this is of course a genocide. And the next word to be noted here is, Holocaust. Holocaust here more than 6 million Jews were exterminated. Three other genocides are generally recognized as fitting under the 1948 UN definition. So, which are they? The 1915 to 1920 mass killings of Armenians by the Ottoman Turks. Here you can see 8 lakh Tutsis were killed. And then in 1994, the Holocaust that happened in Rwanda. So, as I told you now, in this 1994 genocide in Rwanda, 8 lakh Tutsi group of people, Tutsi tribes were killed. And they were killed by the moderate Hutus. So, this was the, this is the second Holocaust, which is recognized by the 1948 convention. So, this is in Rwanda. So, what is the third one? Third one is the Srebrenica massacre of 1995. So, the United Nations Conventions 
of genocide of 1948 until now it recognizes three events as a genocide or a holocaust they are the 1915 1920 armenian holocaust the 19 i'm sorry the 1994 it's not 44 1994 the rwanda holocaust and the srebrenica holocaust of 1995 these are the three things which have been so far recognized <coughs> and now ukraine claims that this russia's war on ukraine also should be recognized as a genocide or a holocaust so speaking about this we have to know certain details about the human rights council why because this is the news that is the resolution in united nations security council was to remove was to remove russia from the human rights council so we have to know certain details about this so it was created by the united nations general assembly in the year 2006 this could be really important the year because we know upsc is known for asking the founding years of such international organizations they have once asked about brics i hope you remember okay i think it was somewhere in 2013 or something they they, they asked uh, the founding year of brics so the founding year of Una human rights council was in 2006 and it was founded by the united nations general assembly the human rights council is an intergovernmental body within the united nations again this is an important point so whether it functions within the united nations or it is an independent body and whether it is a, a private body or like an ngo or it is a intergovernmental body of course it is an intergovernmental body and it works within the united nations it was founded in 2006 this is all about the human rights council now what is the job of this it is responsible for strengthening the promotion and protection of human rights across the world the human rights council it replaced the former un commission on human rights this one you can just use it in mains that's all but this particular data it could be a problems question okay so it replaced something called as united nations commission on human rights and then it formed something called as human rights council the names seem to be similar you have to differentiate it and apart from this it also addresses and makes recommendations on situations of human right violations and can discuss all thematic human rights issues and situations well just to know that's it that's all so that is what a human rights council is supposed to do that's it it's a, nothing to be learned from there but two things to be learned is you can use this statement in your mains exam this one it's really important to be known for prelims In 2007 the human rights council adopted an institution building package this is really important here so what is an institute institution building package to set up its procedures and mechanisms so an institution building package is set up why to frame the rules what and all has to be done that's it so among these were the mechanisms of universal periodic review this word is there in the news universal periodic review so what do they do they assess the human rights situations in all un member states the advisory committee that serves as the council's think tank providing it with expertise and advice on thematic human rights issues and the complaint procedure which allows individuals and organizations to bring human rights violations to the council so two things to be are known here just two things one is the universal periodic review it works as the think tank it works as the think tank of the human rights council the next one whether complaints can be taken by individuals yes complaints can be taken by individuals and also by corporates or any organizations okay so a complaint can be taken by as a whole as an organization or even a single individual can take forward a human rights violation to this think tank called as universal periodic review now the human rights council also works with the united nations special procedures established by the former commission on human rights so we know that already this commission was existing and it has been replaced with the human rights council 
the previous body which existed which is called as the united nations commission on human rights they had established something called as united nations special procedures so they adopted some they had established something called as un special procedures okay so this is also followed by the present united nations human rights council and this particular united nations special procedures it consists of special rapporteurs special representatives independent experts working groups that monitor examine advise and report on thematic issues or human rights situations in specific countries simply they are the watchdog of the united nations human rights council that's it nothing to be known here the one point to be known here is the united nations special procedures it was not established by the united nations human rights council but its predecessor which is called as united nations commission on human rights so it was established by the earlier commission the erstwhile commission and not by, by the present human rights council that's the one thing you have to know about this un special procedures so what about the membership of the council this council it meets at the un office in geneva which is in switzerland it has 47 united nation member states and they are elected by majority vote through a direct and secret ballot at the united nations so gen, uh, in unga there will be a voting a secret ballot voting and this voting will elect the 47 members of the united nation member states a question could be like this all the members of the united nations general assembly will be the members of the human rights council this is how upsc frames questions but actually it's not all the members but unga will elect a group of members that is 47 members and those 47 member states will be the members of the un human rights council and the membership of the council is based on equitable geographical distribution that is africa and asia pacific states have 13 states africa and asia pacific they will have 13 seats okay latin american and caribbean states have eight seats so this latin american region and caribbean region together they will have eight seats and western europe and other states together they will have seven seats eastern european states will have six seats so this is how these 47 seats are filled and russia's three-year term as member of the council it actually began in jan 21 2021 so it is a member of the united nations human rights council among the 47 members now russia is also a member and the news is about removing russia from this membership they have three years of tenure just one year has got over but yet the resolution is to remove them the members serve for three years and are not eligible for immediate re-election after serving for two consecutive terms you have to note both of these so if india is a member of united nations uh, human rights council let us say it serves for three years so whether it is eligible for immediate re-election yes it is eligible so now it is again elected as a member it serves for three more years now whether it is uh, eligible for immediate re-election no so for two consecutive terms a, con a country can be a member of the human rights council but after that it is not eligible for immediate re-election they have to wait for the next re-election okay now what about the leadership of the council the council has a five person bureau consisting of a president and four vice president so one president plus four vice president totally which makes five members and they serve for one year they serve for just one year though the membership of the 47 countries is for three years presidentship and vice presidentship is for one year 
So that is in accordance with the council's annual cycle. So when the council starts from then to the next one year getting over, they will serve for one year. So to be noted here is the membership tenure is for three years and the chairmanship tenure is just for one year. And what about the meeting? The council meets not fewer than three regular sessions a year. So there should not be less than three sessions. And that should account for at least totally 10 weeks. So at least 10 weeks they should have met. And normally these sessions take place in March for four weeks and June three weeks and September three weeks. So in March they meet for four weeks, in June for three weeks and September for three more weeks. So totally it crosses the 10 weeks which they have to be meeting at least for 10 weeks. We know that. And if a third of the member states request, the council can decide at any time to hold a special session to address human rights violations and emergencies. So we know that at least three sessions have to take place and together there should be at least 10 weeks. But if one third, just one third of the total council decides we need a new meeting for any special occasion, a special meeting will be The next one is about the participation of BRICS in a multipolar world. So we know that now presently the world is seemed to be as a multipolar world. So earlier after the world war II, it was a bipolar world it was called so. That is the US on one side and the Soviet Union on the other side. So after the disintegration of Soviet Union in the 1990s the world started to become a unipolar world. But later we can see that this unipolar world, the other parts of the world, the other eastern side of the world, the countries like Asia, Asia, Pacific and so on, they felt that the dominance of the West is growing day by day. So they started to form many small other organizations and that led to something called as a multipolar world. That is many small organizations are there. For example, we can take ASEAN, we can take SARC, we can take Shanghai group, so many and so on. And one such group was the BRICS. So just have a look at these countries here. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. That is all these countries are developing countries and mostly on the eastern part of the world. So they do not want the developed western countries dominance on them so they formed something called BRICS and we have to see elaborately about how BRICS is going to have an upper hand in the multipolar world now. So this group's BRIC, the group was brought together by a geopolitical idea rather than an economic consideration this is really important because in prelims this question could be asked. So this BRICS is a geopolitical group and not an economical group, ASEAN is an economical group. We know that, right? RCEP is an economical group, but BRICS is a geopolitical group. It was first started with Russia and China, just Russia and China started it and then India joined it and then BRICS became because Brazil joined it and the last country to join was, yes, South Africa. That is how it BRIC became BRICS. So this is the journey of BRICS. And now Russia facing the wrath of the western world, it would definitely like to strengthen this BRICS. And moreover, China is also is like a rival to the western dominant world that is particularly to the US. They also will want to be powerful in this BRICS. BRICS is actively involved in the efforts to change the world economic system by increasing the number of non-western states in the international financial institutes. So we know that all these World Bank, IMF, everything are dominant by the Western world. So if any economical problem arises for any country, the deciding factors will be these World, uh, world Bank or IMF and so on. Or these G7 countries or G8 countries, 
OECD and so on all these are western influenced groups or bloc. But here BRICS wants this to be changed. Economical independence is needed for other countries. Economical help is needed for other countries apart from getting help from this western dominated groups or blocks. And for this the BRICS countries decided to create a 100 billion US dollar bank which is called as the BRICS development bank we know this. And apart from this they will also have a reserve currency of 100 billion US dollars. So the base amount will be 100 billion US dollars plus a reserve amount of 100 billion US dollars will be kept in this big development bank so that the western influence or dominance on this financial scene could be reduced a little. The current crisis in Ukraine will help consolidate BRICS as a group. Why? Because it will make further efforts to become a real alternative to the West to create a real multipolar world. They do not want a unipolar world. Particularly when Russia as USSR was existing, there was a bipolar world. But after the disintegration of Russia, it became a unipolar world. So when Russia or actually the erstwhile USSR or the today's Russia, whatever you can take it as, when they found out it is not possible hereafter to be, to be uh, powerful as before to create a multipolar, I am sorry, uh, to create a bipolar world. So the other alternative is to create a multipolar world. The fallout of Russia's membership from G8, which later become G7, we know this. When Russia invaded Crimea, in 2014, because of this, Russia was removed from the G8 group of nations, which later became G7. This raised the prospect that, tactically at least, Russia, India and China may be playing their own triagonal intergrationist card. So, what is an intergrationist card? Intergrationist simply means to form a group, to form a social group. That is what intergrationist means in English. So, these three countries are trying to form a triangular intergrationist card within BRICS as Russia's initiative. So, within this BRICS, we know BRICS is Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. But within this BRICS itself, these three countries, Russia, China and India are trying to frame a triangular Card. So, why this triangular card? These three are directly opposed to the western dominance. So, that is what Russia wants to do now. Now, India and China may stand to reap the best of both worlds as Ukraine plays out. So, here why does Russia or China or particularly why would India go and support this triangular card? So, this triangular card will be supported because India and China both of them know that Russia has no other way other than to support Russia, uh, India and China with this triangular card and so we can be benefited using this. So, it is just a national benefit. And now, Russia has every incentive to accommodate both India and China in the energy sector. You know, India's huge biggest problem is energy sector. Just before few weeks, we saw that Russia announced that we are ready to give oil in cheaper rates to India and India was very ready to welcome it and when this was criticized by US, our external uh, foreign minister, Mr. Jay Shankar gave an amp reply saying that we are not even, we, we, we the, the import of oil from Russia, it is not even just a meager fraction of what Europe is importing. So, first you have to go and take, have a look at Europe, then you can come and talk to us. This was the reply given by our foreign minister, Mr. Jay Shankar. So, why did he say this? He even very specifically mentioned saying that the amount of oil imported, the one month of oil imported from Russia by India is not even equal to the amount of oil imported by Europe for a single afternoon. So, you have to first be talking or uh, taking care about Europe's import of oil from Russia and not about India. And US had to accept this. This is an important thing. India, uh, When India gave this reply, US had to accept this. So, now, especially in the case of Beijing-Moscow axis, in this Beijing-Moscow uh, axis, which has been languishing in limbo due to the price of shipping gas to China. So, Moscow is trying to give shipping gas to 
China. Now, this will create a North Eurasian Intergrationist core within BRICS. So, that is Moscow, Beijing, here you have Delhi. So, this will create something like a North section. So, this is what is expected. It has not happened till now. It is just expected. It, uh, it is what the media is talking about now. So, now this will create a North Eurasian Intergrationist core within BRICS. We know that. Now, the proposed arrangement for rupee-ruble cross-currency pairing as well. So, this is really something to be noted here. So, this is going to be like a turning point or a harbinger. Why a turning point? Because the one problem for India is we do not want to trade with dollars because it, we need lot of foreign currency for that. Uh, we know that each and every day the rupee value is depreciating against US dollar which is not really good for us. So, but we, if we are able to buy oil by just using rupees, it is going to be something great. So, why using rupee to trade is really good for India. Now, look here, when we are, let us say, when we are going to buy oil for 1 billion dollars, let us say. So, we will buy uh, oil for 1 billion dollars. On the other hand, let us say, we spend some 50 crore rupees to buy oil. Now, when this 50 crore rupees is spent to buy oil, it is rupee now. Rupee cannot be used anywhere else in the world, but just in India. The country which receives rupee to sell oil, that country has to send back that rupee back to India to buy something. So, they have no other go other than to buy something for us, which is going to boost our exports. So, that is why this rupee-ruble cross-currency pairing is seen to be such an important thing for India. And India's idea about this is because of the diplomatic triangle in the Indo-Pacific. As I told you, what is this diplomatic triangle? Russia, China and India. Now, Russia's invasion of Ukraine appears to have unwittingly put India at the sweet center of a diplomatic triangle in the Indo-Pacific. So, how can we know this? We know this because we can see diplomats from various nations visiting India. Just before two days, we saw that. British Prime Minister Boris is visiting in India. Russian Foreign Minister comes to India. US Secretary comes to India. So, why? They want the support of India and at the same time, they cannot claim the exclusive support of India as well. India is playing a great game here. In, some, uh, in certain situations, when they want to support US, they support US. In certain situations, when they want to buy something from Russia, when they want the support of Russia, they are ready to support Russia. And no other country is ready to blame India for this because they know that this is what is India doing and this is what is uh, the right thing to be done by India as well. And this is said as, in a beautiful article in Indian Express, it is said, India could be looking at a new dawn. Okay, something new is happening for India. So, we can buy oil for lesser price from Russia as well. On the other hand, US is not in the position of putting sanctions on India for this very purpose because if they are going to put sanctions for India for the reason of buying oil from Russia, they would have to put sanctions on the whole of Europe for that. That is what our uh, foreign minister iterated this in the uh, meeting that happened one week before. Okay. The next topic is about 2 plus 2 dialogue. So, what is this 2 plus 2 dialogue? You have to note something here very specifically that is at the ministry level. At the ministry level, India has 2 plus 2 dialogue only with the United States. But at the secretarial level, however, India has similar 2 plus 2 dialogue with other countries as well. For example, UK also. That is at the ministerial level, it is only with US. That is ministers meet, defense minister and foreign minister from India. They will go and meet there. But in secretary level, 2 plus 2 dialogues are happening with other countries as well. This could be an important point in prelims. You could get confused very easily. Please note it down. Now, the recently happened 2 plus 2 dialogue is the fourth ministerial dialogue with US. It is the fourth time we are doing this. So, who have met from India's side? It is Defense Minister Rajnath Singh and External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar. And on the US counterpart side, Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State. This is what you have to know. Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State. Now, India has recently abstained at the resolution to suspend Russia from Human Rights Council. We know that. 
but at the same time it also condemned the Buka killings. So this was seen as Delhi sending a signal to Moscow for its action against Ukraine. So we can see two things happening. On one side, India stands firm. That is, it's not going to go against Russia, but at the same time, it's not going to support humanitarian crisis or civilian killings in Ukraine. On the other side, the 2 plus 2 dialogue is going on with US. So this is a beautiful balance that India is playing with both the worlds, on side on Russia, on other side with USA. Now certain details about the United Nations. So why? Because recently, the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, he has called for the UN to exclude Russia from the United Nations Security Council directly from UNSC. Because why? Why? Because UNSC is uh, supposed to be an improper organization. Why? Any country, which means that is those five countries, the big five, which have the veto power, they do whatever they want. And if when even if the whole world is against that, very easily they say, I am vetoing it. So this veto power seems to be very much arbitrary. It's not even democratic. So here, Ukrainian president has said, exclude Russia from the Security Council. And he said, are you ready to close the UN and abandon international laws? If you say no to this, then you have to act immediately. Either act immediately here by excluding Russia from UNSC or you just shut down UN and keep walking. There's no use of something called as UN here. This is a talk for a very long time. What is the use of UN actually? The UN Charter. The UN was created by the UN Charter. The Charter was signed in San Francisco in the year 1945, June 26. This is to be known for prelims. And something is there called Article 103. Article 103 of this particular charter states that obligations to the United Nations prevail over all other treaty obligations. So, any other treaty signed by any other country, all are subsumed by the United Nations. If, some, if there is a tussle, whether I follow a particular convention or a treaty or whether I follow the United Nations, you have to follow United Nations. Even if, that, even if the, any other particular treaty is in contention with the United Nations, you are supposed to follow United Nations because United Nations is the topmost one. This is what Article 103 tries to say. But what does the veto power say? The veto power guarantees that permanent members can never be removed from the council. So this is the problem here. Ukrainian president says remove Russia from the security council. But this veto power is there which will make sure that you cannot remove it. So if you have to do something in the United Nations Security Council, all the five members have to accept it. If any one member raises their hand saying that I am going to call for veto, you cannot pass that resolution at all. So ultimately it means that you cannot remove a member from the United Nations Security Council. And this is really important here because India has been fighting for a very long time to have a position in the United Nations Security Council. It's asking to expand the United Nations Security Council. Along with it, Japan and Germany are also fighting for this same, same reason. And against this, there are certain countries which are actually called as the coffee club with countries, uh, members such as uh, Italy, Pakistan and so on, who oppose this expansion of United Nations uh, Security Council because these countries do not want countries like India, Germany or uh, Japan to have veto powers or have uh, good powers in the United Nations Security Council. So please try to read all these because when such a thing about United Nations Security Council is in news, we have to know about all these G4 nations and uh, uh, coffee club and so on. And United Nations Charters Article 6, it says something very specific. It allows the General Assembly to exclude a member only upon the recommendation of the Security Council. So, if you have to remove someone from the United Nations Security Council, it is almost impossible because they have veto powers. If you have to exclude something from or some country from United Nations General Assembly, that has to be accepted by the Security Council. So, this is what the Article 6 says. Now, the next topic is about the Trikonomalay oil farm deal. So, what is this? It was signed in Jan 22 this year between India and Sri Lanka. 
So this region, it has oil tanks in 850 acres of dense jungle. So this is the problem here. Though we have signed a deal here, what are we and how are we going to do this in this dense jungle and which has been kept unused for decades together. Here, it is a strategic natural harbor, something to be noted by you is, this trigonomaly is a natural harbor. It is one of the best natural harbors in entire Asia. The tree cover or the foliage is so thick that the place is now home to several species of animals and birds. And now cutting down the trees needs government's permission. Now, if you cut down the trees, there are protests as well. So, how are we going to manage this is a huge question mark. So, in future, it could be a key to Sri Lanka's energy security while giving India additional capacity for reserves. So, what is the use of this deal? That is, in future, Sri Lanka could have energy security using this. And what is there for India? It, India could have additional capacity for reserves of oil. Now, this agreement gives India a strategic footprint on Sri Lanka's eastern coast. So, you can see Trigonamalai is here. It could be a map question. Please note it down. Now, with this, it will have access to the China Bay Harbour. China Bay Harbour is very much nearer to this Trigonamalai. And it is said to be the finest natural harbour in Asia, as I told you now. Okay. Now, the joint development was first mentioned actually way back in 1987 itself in the India-Sri Lanka Accord. And now, an agreement was really reached in 2003, but it was never finalized. So, it started in 1987. Almost there was an agreement in 2003, but it failed. Now, at last in 2022, they have successfully done it. Here, the tanks are being refurbished for uh, three commercial activities. Supply of petrol and diesel across the country to store petroleum products and to offer bunkering facilities. So, what are they going to do is, they are going to refurbish this, clean it up and they are going to use it for three purposes, store oil and uh, distribute oil for the whole country of Sri Lanka and then also for bunkering facilities. And here you can see a clearer picture of this Trigonamalai region on the eastern side of Sri Lanka. This is the actual harbour. You can see a very good bay sort of harbour here. That is why this is called as one uh, Asia's finest natural harbour. You can see this region here. And uh, that's it for today. Jai Hind. If you had uh, liked this content, please share it with your friends. Let's learn and grow together. If you have any comments or anything to tell us or anything to be changed from our side, can always comment on the comment section thank you